This is Up Close. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. On this week's episode, we're talking about intermarriage, one famous union that shocked high New York society, and a look at what marrying outside the faith means in America overall. He is a legendary district attorney and heir to a famous and wealthy Jewish dynasty. She was a hippie who'd become the youngest ever woman to win the Pulitzer Prize. And amid those differences was also a 27-year difference in age. Lucinda Freitz talks about how she and Bob Morgenthau made a life together in Timeless, Love, Morgenthau, and Me. But not every marriage lasts as long as that one, and intermarriage broadly is actually far more likely to end in divorce. But what else differentiates intermarriage from other marriages in America? Creating a picture of interfaith marriage through commissioning national surveys and conducting in-depth interviews is Naomi Schaefer Riley, author of Till Faith Do Us Part, How Interfaith Marriage is Transforming America. But first, here's my interview with Lucinda Franks. So you were the youngest woman to win the Pulitzer Prize for journalism, and you were uh, looking at a, a great career ahead of you, and, um, and as this young firebrand leftist, and then you run into this 50-something 50 uh, something district attorney. And how does that become a relationship? My first meeting with Bob Morgenthau was I interviewed him. Uh, for the Watergate scandal that I'd been assigned to cover by UPI, United Press International, where I worked at the time. I was in my early 20s. And uh, I asked him a lot of detailed questions, but I asked some of the same questions over because I was fascinated by his forehead. He had the most magnificent forehead, and he just was the most unusual person had you chosen men by their foreheads to that point? Or uh, it, certainly <laughs> not, but yeah. I, had chosen, I had chosen against Hollywood model, um, you know, good looks. I like quirky, uh, quirky good looks. He actually, because I asked the same questions over again, he said to himself, this is either the dumbest or the smartest reporter I've ever met. And uh, after I wrote my story, he decided, I was the smartest. Throughout your, your relationship, uh, for your husband, um, he showed, he, he wasn't, he didn't necessarily wear like a very obviously Jewish identity on his sleeve, but he had these, he had his particular Jewish thing. One of them was Israel, one of them was the Holocaust. And, and one of the things he did was, one of his episodes though, was when he was offered or asked, I guess, to, to kind of make, make a Holocaust memorial in New York happen. Yeah, against great opposition. Uh, in fact, there were four other people that were commissioned also. And, you know, they kind of dropped like flies because there was a, a great uh, po part of the popu Jewish population in New York that did not want a New York Holocaust Museum. And Bob, um, one weekend said, Darn it, I am going to get that money and we're going to build that museum. The whole weekend he was on the phone. He called everybody from Steven Spielberg to Steve Ross of War Warner Brothers. Uh, and <laughs> the secretaries would say, uh, the district attorney Robert Morgenthau is on the line. And <laughs> these big guys would, you know, drop everything and say, hello, hello, Mr. Morgenthau. And they were so glad that they weren't being investigated and they were only being asked for money. They gave these huge sums. So at the end of the weekend, he had millions of dollars. You know, within Israel and, and this whole idea of, of kind of finding anti-Semitism in different places, that led to probably the most controversial moment in your journalism career. Also, interestingly, taking place at the time you were delivering your first child, you were writing a profile of the Israeli defense minister, and he had some things to say about the American, uh, his American counterpart, and, and it, how did that go? In one of our trips to Israel, uh, I had been assigned by the Times to do a, uh, a profile on Moshe Aaron's. It was gonna be a cover story, it was a cover story, uh, who was to be the prime minister. I was a little provocative and I said, you know, what do you think about Caspar Weinberger and, and the fact he's Jewish and yet he seems so anti-Israeli? Moshe Aaron said, oh, he's impossible. And I said, how, how do you think he's impossible? I mean, 
Well, what do you mean your heart of hearts? I mean, hey, he's really a, a strange guy, isn't he? And Moshe said, he ought to see a psychiatrist. Right, that, that, was, that's an international incident, right? It, well, it was, <laughs> it was because um, I, I was then, I wrote the story, handed it in. They were, you know, absolutely uh, delighted with having this controversial uh, thing that Moshe had said. Uh, and I happened to be eight months pregnant. And then I was delivering my child. I was in the labor room and uh, the New York Times called and said, Casper Weinberger says he's going to um, stop the shipment of warplanes uh, to Israel because of Aaron's remark. Aaron's denies he said it. And I thought, oh no. <laughs> because, you know, in one second, a whole reputation of a journalist can go like that. And Bob piped up and said, who was in the labor room, he said, I was there, I heard it. He said, let me talk to the Times. So he took the phone and good old Bob said, you know, I was there, I heard it. So the editor said, so we'll say we can stand by the story. And will you be quoted, Mr. Morgenthau? He says, yes, I will. And now taking a broad and deep look at interfaith marriage in America with Naomi Schaefer Riley. There's a different tone within the Jewish community specifically about how we talk about interfaith marriage and how it's talked about in, in America more broadly. Well, I mean, I think, you know, just looking at the Jewish community, there's been a shift in tone inside the Jewish community just in the last couple of decades. I mean, when I grew up, uh, you know, I can remember listening to sermons about the 1990 Jewish population survey and how this was the next Holocaust. And right, which that was a famously uh, leading to alarmist population survey where they found that intermarriage was somewhere north of 50 percent mm -hmm. and all of a sudden a bunch of people say this is the end of the Jewish mm -hmm. community. Yeah. I think since then, you know, certainly intermarriage in the Jewish community has started to level off to some extent. Um, but I also think that even within the conservative movement, which is where I grew up and where I'm now raising my children, um, you see a definite shift in tone. There is a more broad acceptance of interfaith marriage and also a sense that we need to figure out a way to bring up the children in interfaith marriage in Jewish homes. Right, but at the same time, in particular, the Jewish community, something that's surprised me as I've learned more about it is the degree to which it's almost impossible to find a rabbi who will perform an interfaith marriage. Well, certainly a lot of people are just getting married by justices of the peace. You know, more and more it's very common for people in intermarriages to get uh, to get married by, you know, the friend who was just, you know, um, somehow turned into a representative of the state of Massachusetts or something for the day to marry you. Um, you know, one interesting discussion I think in the conservative movement is more and more rabbis are saying they would like to be able to at least attend the wedding. Although many of these couples, you know, will then say, oh, well, well, sure, you didn't want to marry me, and now you want my kids to go to preschool. And there is uh, obviously a and certain... And pay for it. Right, and there, well, yes, the cost of the Jewish community is another thing. But I think, um, you know, some people feel there is a certain disconnect there. If there's one number that you just, it's just kind of a laugh out loud number when you, when you look at uh, the results of your survey, it's that for almost every single uh, marriage that involves, uh, that involves people from different religions or different denominations, uh, there is a greater reported dissatisfaction with the marriage in the intermarried situations, mm -hmm. except for the Jews. Right. So the Jews are happier. <laughs> the Jews are the only group that are happier when they're married to someone who's not Jewish. Right. So I did have. I do. I do offer this caveat that the survey is 2,500 people, but it is not a statistically representative sample of Jews. It's very hard to get that. And obviously, other surveys that are just of the Jewish community have tried to look at this issue. Um, that being said, I think you know, for for some of the couples that I interviewed. Um, you know, the closer the, you know, the religions are together, the less likely they are to have dissatisfaction, but also the less practicing you are, the less likely you are to have that sense of dissatisfaction too. That's all for this week's abbreviated web episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable, or listen to the full audio of the show as a podcast available on iTunes and your favorite podcast player. The Jewish channel is available on cable, Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, 
Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast on the on-demand menu on premium channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.